The theme that I'm going to take this week for six mornings is the theme of the kingdom. Because I believe that God is looking for men and women whose orientation is towards the kingdom rather than their parish or their little fellowship or their family or their immediate circumstances. Who've got a big enough mind and heart to seek first before anything else his kingdom in Scotland. That, I believe, is a big enough task for us to get really prepared for. Anything less than that is less than God's goal. And therefore, we're going to look at the kingdom for six mornings. Now, let's start with our Bibles. There are two particular passages that I think we ought to read this morning. The first is Psalm number 2. Psalm number 2. This morning I believe we've got to get things into perspective and see things God's way rather than ours. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in, in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And then we'll turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 4. It's one of the true stories in the Bible that always leaves me trembling. It's uh, an incredible picture of a man who became an animal. Verse 28 of Daniel chapter 4. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this great Babylon? I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. He was, of course, reciting the Lord's Prayer, but he'd got it a little wrong. He was saying, mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Just got one word wrong. The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High 
is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to the throne became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Just one other verse in the first book of Chronicles, chapter 29, the last chapter in the first book. And verse 11, which gets the words right. We'll start at verse 10. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head overall. Well, somebody said that if you read from the Bible before you preach, at least something of what you say is worthwhile. And and God's Word has a tremendous majesty about it that just enlarges your spirit. Now, there are many people who believe that what we need is a change of government. I agree But what kind of a government are we going to change to? Most people, when they talk about a change of government, they either mean a change of party, or a change of policy, or a change of leader, or even a change of system. And there are those who would dearly love to bring in proportional representation into British politics, especially the SDP alliance, who always seem to come second. Nevertheless, that's not what I'm talking about. I believe that Jesus' message was that the basic need of this world, which includes Scotland, is a change of government. And that's what I'm going to talk about all this week. But Jesus never used the word government. He used the word kingdom rather than government. And I just want to say to Scotland, God wants Scotland to become a kingdom again. I'm not here to advocate the cause of Scottish nationalism. I'm here to plead for a change of government to a kingdom. Now, I want to describe for you what it is like to live in a kingdom. What is a kingdom? What kind of government is it? 
And the answer is very simple. It is quite different from the kind of government we have in what we now call the United Kingdom. It's not all that united, but that's what we live in. And, and we British are masters at compromise, at muddle. Or if I may be so bold, the English are even better at muddling through than the Scots. And, and we revel in calling ourselves a kingdom when we're not a kingdom. We haven't been a kingdom for centuries, either in England or in Scotland. We have had kings and queens, but that doesn't make a kingdom. In fact, the British Isles are now a republic. A republic is a form of government where you have one person who is the head of state and another person who is the head of government. In other words, a republic has one person who reigns and another person who rules. And at the moment, Queen Elizabeth reigns, but Margaret Thatcher rules. Okay? And that is not a kingdom. And it's foolish to call ourselves a kingdom. Indeed, I often pity the Queen because she has to reign without ruling. She has very little power indeed. We have steadily over the centuries robbed our royal family of any chance of ruling. You did the same in Scotland even before our two nations were united. You had also embarked on the course of having a king, but not letting him rule, of wanting someone to reign over you, but not to rule over you. In fact, one of the few prerogatives the Queen has in England and Scotland is this. If in a general election there were a dead heat, she would have the casting vote. But I can hardly imagine that ever happening, can you? In fact, I saw a list the other day of the only things that the Queen can do by way of exercising her own authority. And there were only ten things on that list, and most of them were emergency acts. Now, in other republics, they have an elected president. We prefer to retain an inherited presidency. But the fact is, it is still republican rather than royal in its outworking. Now, I'm not now being a Willie Hamilton. I am just stating the bold or blunt facts that we do not know what it is like to live in a kingdom. You may think you do, but you have no idea. I have never yet had to make any decision in daily life that had to pay attention to what the Queen wished. Have you? Can you think of any moment in your life when you stopped and said, now what would the Queen want me to do in this situation? Hands up if anybody's ever done that. You see, we just don't even take her will into account. We may like to see her parade and we may cheer her and wave Union Jacks and the rest, but we have no intention of letting her rule over us. We live in what's called a constitutional monarchy. In fact, that was the big debate between King James VI of Scotland and George Buchanan, his tutor. George Buchanan tried to teach the future king that he derived his sovereignty from the people and that he must always defer to the will of the people and that they had a perfect right to get rid of him if he didn't. And because the future King James hated his tutor and loathed him intensely, he read secretly some books by a French philosopher called Jean Baudin. And in those books, the French philosopher said, kings should rule as well as reign. In a kingdom, the king's wish is law. And James the first, the sixth and James the first of England 
in reaction to its tutor, tried to return to a true kingdom. It was that and his passing on that view to King Charles I that led ultimately to Charles I's execution. Well, I'm not going to give you any more history. I can now tell you what a kingdom is. A kingdom is a people ruled by one man. And that one man's will is law. He has no government to debate his will. He simply declares his will. And he has that job of reigning and ruling by inheritance. He is king because he was the son of a father who was also king. He has no cabinet and certainly there is no opposition. He is not put into that position by a vote, nor can he be voted out of that position. That is a kingdom, and these British Isles are not a kingdom. King or Prince Charles may become, become King Charles III, but he will reign without ruling. And the concept of kingship throughout the Bible from cover to cover is that the king rules as well as reigns. Now I have a question to ask you, which I believe is from the Lord and which is the burden of my heart for this week. It was about three or four months ago that I first heard the Lord say this, and I ask you to check it in your spirit before you accept it. But I felt the Lord was saying something like this to us. Why do you expect me to act as sovereign when you are not willing to be my subjects? That's my burden for this week. Why do you expect me to act as sovereign in your land when you are not willing to be my subjects? It is one of the failings of human nature when it has not experienced a kingdom to desire sovereignty without becoming subject. In all the discussions before the general election, I heard many people discussing what the future government should do for us. I never heard anybody discuss what we should do for the future government. Is that true for you also? I never heard a discussion of the responsibility of citizens towards the government. I never heard a discussion as to how we could get together and finance what we wanted the government to do. We left that to them also. The only things that were discussed before the election were we want a government that will act sovereignly and reduce unemployment and reduce inflation and take away nuclear arms and give us a nice, comfortable, easy, happy life. That's all I heard. I never heard one discussion about what it would cost to be subject to that government. And so we want a government that will do things for us, but we do not want to discuss what we might have to do for the government. In the same way, people who have been accustomed to this kind of thinking, Christians allow the spirit of the world to creep over into their thinking. And it is part of our failing that we want to God to act sovereignly in our land, and we pray for him to do so, but we do not discuss the other side of the kingdom, which is how to be subject to the rule of the king. Let me tell you what I mean. In the early days of the spiritual renewal for which we all praise God, I sensed there were many people who were seeking to have God's sovereignty exercised over them in the sense of healing their diseases, taking away their depressions, giving them answers to the problems for which they sought guidance. But there were very few asking the Spirit 
to tell them how to be subject to the kingly rule of Jesus Christ. Announce a healing meeting and you could guarantee a large attendance. But you see, our bodies are to be the temples of the Holy Spirit. And that means this, that God was looking not just for bodies to heal, but for bodies he could rule. And if your body is ruled by the King of Heaven, then that's an end to gluttony. That's an end to drunkenness. That's an end to sex outside marriage and a whole lot of other things. Do you hear what I'm saying? There were thousands who wanted God to exercise sovereignty over their disease. But not so many who wanted God to exercise sovereignty over their bodies. I trust you're hearing my burden. Because the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are subject. And those who are concerned with the kingdom will not just be praying for God to exercise his sovereignty, whether in healing or other release or in revival, but will be seeking to bring Scotland into subjection to his will. And in his subjection, there's perfect freedom. You see, every kingdom is made up of two parts. Every kingdom has a sovereign on the one hand, but a kingdom is incomplete if it just has a sovereign. A kingdom is complete when the sovereign has subjects who willingly accept his leadership. Let me rush straight through to another conclusion. One of the most frequent questions I get asked these days is this, shall I stay in my church or not? How many of you have at least considered that question? Could I see? Be honest. So a good number of you have been asking that question. Do you want to know my answer to it? Do you want to know whether I'm a come outer or a stay in it? You're going to be disappointed. I don't know how many letters I've received, how many people have asked me verbally, should I stay in or come out? My answer is very simple. You obey the king. That's all. If the king tells you to come out, you come out. If the king tells you to stay in, you stay in. That's your sole concern if you want to be a subject of the king. And it seems to me that he's telling some people to stay in and some people to come out. And it's quite wrong for either group to tell the other what they should be doing. What we should be encouraging each other to do is to obey the king. Not to weigh up the pros and cons. Not to consider the consequences. But to say, Lord, you are king. And I tell you that God is looking for subjects in Scotland. He's not just looking for those who will say, God, will you act sovereignly in our land? Will you sweep through with revival? Will you take over? Will you smash this? Will you deal with that? Will you clear up disorder? Will you deal with violence? Oh, how much we want God to act as sovereign. And he says, but I am looking for subjects. It was the Lord's own problem on a later morning. We shall look at the kingdom of heaven in the life of Jesus. And I can sum up his problem in one sentence. The people wanted a sovereign, but Jesus was looking for subjects, and he couldn't find them. That was the crisis. They wanted a king who'd release them, who'd deliver them, who'd feed them, who'd look after them, be a kind of mini welfare state all in himself. But when he spelled out what it was to be a subject of the kingdom, and he spelled it out in detail in the Sermon on the Mount, as we shall see. He couldn't find anyone who was willing to be subject. Now that's my burden for this week. Forgive me if I'm making a wrong assumption. You may already be a true subject of the King. I wonder if you came here hoping that God would act sovereignly in some situation in your life. 
some family situation in some health situation well he may well do I marvel as I marvel at Jesus that he was willing to cleanse lepers who didn't even come back to say thank you nevertheless I believe God this week is looking for subjects then he can exercise his sovereignty in Scotland it is not that he is helpless without subjects but there is a sense in which he is incomplete without them and the church completes his fullness on earth in that sense so my burden is to combine sovereignty and subjection even the word subjection is anathema to us we don't like to be considered as subjects subject to another's will now how would you like to live in a kingdom would you welcome it or not my answer is that would entirely depend on the king if he was a good king I would welcome it if he was a bad king I'd hate it and as I read Scottish history and I've read it again this week before coming as I read the history of Israel everything depended on whether there was a good king or a bad king and I can define them a good king is someone who is first of all concerned about his subjects who is concerned about their welfare their protection their well-being a bad king is someone who is primarily concerned with his own status or power or wealth and you can find history is strewn with good kings and bad kings a bad king will lay heavy burdens on his subjects because he has to pay for all his kinging but a good king will lay light burdens on his subjects Do you hear the words of Jesus my burden is light He's saying I'm a good king In my kingdom there are more benefits than burdens Whereas in a bad king's kingdom there are more burdens than benefits Would you really like to live in a country where one man made all the laws and there was no election no votes and you had no choice Would you Well, do you know there's something to be said for a benevolent dictatorship. We were not made for democracy. I I read a lovely comment this week that during World War II we fought to make the world safe for democracy. And then discovered that democracy was not safe for the world. That's a cynical remark. But the fact is that you and I were not made to run our own lives. We crave for leadership. And one of the things I notice in modern politics is that invariably it's a contest about the leadership. Have you noticed that? And we pin messianic hopes on the leader of a party. It's an impossible task to expect Margaret Thatcher or anyone else to get us out of the mess we're in is asking too much and so we elect them and not long later we are disillusioned and looking for another leader how many of you could name six members of the cabinet do you think anybody i'm not going to test you but in fact the election is about leadership in Israel which reflects the world situation so frequently Israel is swinging from democratic government to kingdom government have you noticed that in the press the reason is that the early years of the state of Israel were dominated by the Ashkenazi Jew from northern Europe and western civilization men like David Ben Gurion and women like Golda Meir and their dream was of a social democracy not now if you go to Israel now you'll find their dream is of a strong king 
and the Sephardic Jew from the Orient now has the major vote in Israel. And the Sephardic Jew never lived in democracy. Most of them lived in kingdoms. And now when they cheer Begin, as they did during the Lebanese crisis, when half a million Jewish people filled the squares of Tel Aviv, they were shouting, King Begin, King Begin, King Begin. I shall be in Jerusalem in September for the Feast of Tabernacles. One of the things I want to say is, you are right to look for a king rather than a democratic government. But Begin's the wrong man. But I see God preparing the world for kingship again. Since 1914, 24 crowned heads of Europe have fallen. Kings have been disappearing like ninepins. We're one of the very few countries left that still has a notional royal family around. And yet, as the world swung away from royalty to republicanism, I detect now a swing back. People are looking again for authority. People are looking again for leadership. And people are looking again for a king. They may not use that word, but that's what deep in their hearts they're looking for. And the reason is they were made for it. I've got another book here which uh, I've just reread with interest. It's the story of Saudi Arabia, and it's called The Kingdom. And when I read that book, I find it's much, much nearer the Bible than any book on the history of England or Scotland. They are still a kingdom in Saudi Arabia. My wife and I lived for two and a half years in the Arabian Peninsula. And we had some first-hand contact with this kingdom and the people of it. It's a kingdom. There has been no general election in that place. There is no opposition. It is ruled by one family, and that rule is passed on from father to son. But some of you may remember that they had a crisis. King Saud, who was the son of Abdul Aziz, the first son to reign in his father's place was, as you know from your history, and some of you are old enough to remember it, he was a bad king. And so finally they came and proposed to King Saud. All the other princes of the royal family came and said, King Saud, we want to propose that Saudi Arabia becomes a constitutional monarchy. You may continue to reign, but not to rule we will rule and I'm fascinated with King Saud's response he said I am not Queen Elizabeth that was his response in anger he said I refuse to reign but not rule it was not in the Arabian tradition for rulers to wear the appearance of power without its substance kings were kings or nothing. How could Saud feel self-respect? How could men respect him if his dignity was just a facade? I commend the whole book. You'll find that page after page is talking in a way that the Bible talks. The kingdom. Arabs know what it is to live in a kingdom. And though they are kept from entering the kingdom of heaven by the demonic religion of Islam, nevertheless they understand what is meant when you talk to them about the kingdom of God. So let me come right down to brass tacks. We have been so accustomed to regarding God as Father that we have overlooked the fact that he is King. Whenever a Jew begins his meal, he gives thanks to God, and he calls him one thing. He says, King of the universe, and then he thanks him. Now, during the rest of this week, I want to speak first and for the rest of this morning about the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God. Then I want to talk about the kingdom of Satan. 
And until you realize that Scotland is part of the kingdom of Satan, you will not see what the warfare really is. That your nice neighbors are in fact citizens of another kingdom, as you once were. You won't understand the true situation. Then I'm going to speak about the kingdom of Israel, which gives us a glimpse of the patterns of government which he wants us to live under. Then I'm going to speak about the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then I'm going to speak about the kingdom that is mediated to us through the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that only those who have rediscovered the Holy Spirit have rediscovered the kingdom. Have you noticed that? And finally, I'm going to talk about the kingdom of the Father, which is where it will all end. So that's what we hope to get through in five mornings. How's the time going, Jimmy? How are we? All right. Let's start this morning with the kingdom of God. That was introduction so far. I'm sorry if I'm traveling a bit more slowly than I usually do, but... Um, there are physical reasons for that. The word God means someone who was always there and someone who is in total charge. And in many language of, languages of the world, the word God and the word King are the same word. don't know if you realize that. There's a word in the Middle East, for example, Melek which means both king and God. And in the ancient world, there was no question that to say God was to say king. The thought of a God who didn't rule as well as reign was anathema. Yet I believe that one of our biggest problems in these islands today is a view of God that has turned him into a constitutional monarch. Do you read my heart in that? Do you know what I mean by that? That God is treated like Queen Elizabeth is treated. Not taken into account in daily life. Not considered as actually in charge. Not in control. And uh, I want to spend the rest of this morning about this. The Bible opens with God as king. You've got to read a long way through the Bible before you find God as Father. You've got to read even further into the Bible before you read that God is love. But the Bible begins with a picture of God as King, sitting on a throne, issuing commands which are instantaneously and universally obeyed. I have just made a series of ten videotapes. This is the commercial, by the way. But I've just made 10 videotapes, especially for home group listening. Audio tapes are fine for listening as individuals, but in groups you don't know where to look, do you? So I've made videotapes on the first three chapters of Genesis. Just 10 tapes that uh, are a series of talks for Christians and their non-Christian neighbors to come in and watch. And so I just commend those to you. But the more I looked into the first three chapters, the more I realized that that's where the battle still is. Genesis 1 has ten commandments in it. The first ten commandments in the Bible are all in the first chapter. And they were obeyed. Every one. God simply had to say it and it was done. You have a picture in Genesis 1 and 2 of an entire universe subject to the sovereignty of God. What a wonderful place it is too. Don't you get a feeling it must have been a beautiful world? What a place to live in. Everything so good, so beautiful. No disease, no death, no war, no famine. Enough for every animal and every man to eat. A place that was not only useful but beautiful. 
I love the way that God realized that human beings didn't just need cabbages, they needed pansies and tulips. That we need beauty as well as usefulness, and so he didn't put us in an allotment, but in a garden. He put the wild animals out in the field, but for men he planted a garden because we would appreciate beauty. Everything was beautiful, paradise. If only the world had stayed that way, and the reason it was that way was that God was king. When he said, let there be light, there it was. He was sovereign, and everything was subject to his sovereignty. And that's sheer heaven on earth. When we read the story of creation to our little girl once, she just sat back at the end and she just said, no sooner said than done, wasn't it? <laughs> what a beautiful response. It's a perfect analysis. God said, let the dry land appear. There it was. He just had to issue a command and it was obeyed. My wife and I, for the first time in our married life, have a home that's our own. And uh, it's a lovely place. We've got the most beautiful garden. We asked the Lord for a garden that wouldn't require any looking after because we travel such a lot. And he's given us the most beautiful garden that requires no digging, no weeding, nothing. Can you guess what it is? It's all water. It's a pond about the size of this hall surrounded by trees and our little house sits on the edge of it and we have a number of ducks moor hens a couple of kingfishers a few white doves it's a beautiful little spot and uh, the whole pond is a, a spring of living water so it never needs weeding or never goes stagnant it's just beautiful we've called the house living waters for obvious reasons no it's still waters i mean it's still waters but as I sit in my study and look out at this beautiful scene, I think, why is it beautiful? The answer is because everything I can see is subject to God. That's all. Then I turn on the television and listen to the news. Or I read the newspaper, and it seems as if nothing is subject to God. And it's ugly. It's horrible. Those clouds in the sky, those hills, they have to obey God. They have no choice. And one of the reasons the surroundings we have here are good for our souls is that you're looking at things that are subject to God. His sovereignty is all around you. Now there are those many people who believe that God may have created all this but he no longer controls it. I want to give you two philosophical terms now. Do you mind two minutes philosophy lesson? I am your tutor for this morning. Deism and theism. And the greatest enemy of God in this land is not atheism, it is deism. So I better explain what I mean. Deism believes that God created all things, but no longer controls them. He made this universe like a watch, wound it up, and now it operates according to its own laws. My wife's brother is a meteorologist. Some of you may have seen him on the TV telling us what's coming next. I've had many discussions with him. I had a discussion with him just 24 hours ago, was it? And you know, he's dealing with weather all the time, but he can't see God's hand in it. He's a Methodist lay preacher, but he can't see that God is in control. He's examining meteorological laws, quote, all the time. I once showed him the incredible parallel between the history of Israel and the rainfall of Israel. And I got the figures, in fact, he got them for me. The figures for the rain on Israel for the last 150 years. And you can actually plot the political history of Israel from the rainfall chart. 
it's extraordinary. Every time there was an aliyah, uh, a new wave of immigration of Jews to Israel, the rainfall went up. And it reached the all-time record for a century in the spring of 1948. Now, I could say more about this, but here was the graph of the rainfall of Israel. And you could label each hump in it with a major political event, some new immigration or the establishment of the state or something. Now, to a Jew, that is no problem at all. In fact, when the first aliyah, the first wave of immigration between 1872 and 1875 took place, the rain fell as it had not fallen for centuries and the rabbis fell on the ground and praised the king of the universe because he'd restored the rain. But how many people today really believe in this country that God is in total control of the weather. I'm almost bold enough to say that every time you complain about the weather, you become a deist. Do you follow me? You're saying God isn't in control. Or if you think he is, you're saying you don't like the way he's running things. Now the big question is whether we're deist or theist. The vast majority of people in this country believe in God, but they are deist. They're not theist. The important question is not, do you believe in God, but what kind of a God do you believe in? Do you believe in the living God or not? Now let me tell you a story some of you may have heard me say. Some time ago, Thames Television rang me up and said, would you come and take part in a discussion on the question, does God answer prayer by performing miracles today? Well, you couldn't keep me away from a, a discussion like that. So my wife and I got in the car, went to Teddington Studios, and we went into the reception room for, uh, appearing, for guests appearing on the show. And we were introduced, horror of horrors, to about 20 people, all of whom were gonna take part in a 25 minute discussion. I thought there were going to be three or four of us, but 20 of us for a 25-minute discussion. You do a quick mental arithmetic and think, I've got three quarters of a minute to speak. What can I say in three quarters of a minute? But we were introduced to the rest of the guests. There was a punk rocker held together with safety pins, as far as we could see. There was a housewife. There was a teacher. There was a real-life bishop. I speak physically. There was um, an ex-moderator of the Church of Scotland, whose name I wouldn't dare to say here because most of you would know it. There was a even, well-known evangelical professor who has published many books. I was relieved when the door opened and Colin Urquhart walked in and uh, felt there was somebody there with a fellow feeling. But they introduced me to a man of about 50 in a bright red shirt. He deliberately put it on to catch the camera's eye, I'm sure. And, and he was introduced as the president of the British Humanist Association. Now, we went into the studio and sat down, and Colin and I kept close together for safety, I suppose. And, and we sat in the second row of a tiered platform. And immediately in front of me was this humanist with the um, evangelical professor on one side and the bishop on the other. And we looked down, and he had by his side a pile of newspaper cuttings from the Sunday Gutter Press. Horrible stuff. The top one was about that poor girl pummeled to death by two misguided young men trying to get a demon out of her. Do you remember that? And he had all these dreadful, scandalous stories to attack Christianity clearly. They were not on the subject, but he, he'd come well armed and well prepared. So I nudged Colin and said, we've just time to pray. And before the program began, we both put our heads down and we said, Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we bind those newspaper articles so that he can't even use them. And then we opened eyes just in time for the red light to go on camera one. Well, the chairman, Dick Tavern QC, you've heard of Dick Tavern, the SDP man. He turned to the evangelical professor early in the 
show and said, now, what do you think about this, Professor? And the Professor was very nervous, and he jumped, and he knocked over a glass of water, which fell on the newspaper articles and stuck them to the floor. And when the humanists tried to get these newspaper articles, they came away in shreds. And he was picking at them with his little fingernail, I can see him now, and he just couldn't get them up and they were just ripped to pieces and he couldn't use one of them. And while this was happening, the chairman turned to me and said, now we've got David Pawson with us. What do you think? Do you think God answers prayer today? <laughs> The, the, frust, the frustration was that I couldn't point to the articles because I didn't want to draw attention to them. So I told the story of a friend of mine, a building contractor who was as tough as they come. They said of him that the softest part of him was his teeth. And then he was converted and became like a little child. And one night, he had an emergency telephone call or a telephone call late at night from a friend of his who lived 300 miles away and the friend rang him up and just said Bill I want to say goodbye and thank you and he said what do you mean where are you going well he said I, I'm, I'm going to end it all he said you're the only man who's ever helped me so I want to say thank you but he says the business has collapsed marriage has collapsed and I have nothing to live for, so goodbye. And my friend Bill said, stay there, don't do a thing, I'm coming straight to you. And he dashed out to get his car, got in the car, set off to drive to save this man's life, got 75 miles into the country, and the car stopped. And he looked at the petrol gauge and it was against empty. And he kicked himself, why did he set out without looking? He waited for cars to come along the road, none came. He looked around, not a light in sight, he was in the middle of the country. So being a very new young Christian, he prayed. And then he shook the car to try and get some petrol up into the carburetor and he managed to get it going again. And he set off again and a few hours later he drove into the drive of that other man, having not stopped in 270 miles on an empty tank and he saved the man's life and he saved his soul as soon as I'd finished saying that in three quarters of a minute the humanist turned to the bishop and said do you believe that bishop and the bishop said <laughs> he said well I have a different view of prayer to David Pawson he said, for me, prayer is not asking for things. It's communing with the Almighty. And the humanist sneered. Corn of his lip turned up. At the end of the program, the humanist turned around and he said to Colin and myself, you two are genuine. He said, I don't believe a word you've said. But he said, you obviously believe that God still answers prayer. And then he pointed at the bishop and at the evangelical professor and at the ex-moderator of the Church of Scotland and said, they don't believe, do they? Now, what do you say then? I think you've got to be honest with the world. And I said, no, they don't. But some of us still do. Now, what had he spotted? He'd spotted that there is a division line right through the church, right through the clergy between those who believe in God and those who believe in the living God. Those who view him as father, but who not understood him as king. And those who believe he's the father in heaven and the king of the universe and still in charge. That is the difference between deism and theism. And if there is one thing that the renewal of the Holy Spirit has done, it has turned thousands of deists into theists. And an atheist is not an adeist. An atheist is not someone, according to the Bible, who doesn't believe in God, but someone who doesn't believe is in charge. And it's that kind of atheism that is our problem.
Well, now let's go a little further. King of the universe. I'm being critical, I know, of the church. It is as one who identifies with the church and, and who wants to wake up the church. But recently I turned on a religious program. Now, usually I get angry over religious TV programs. And since the, I can't take it out of the people on the screen, I take it out of whoever's in the room. And my wife didn't appreciate me watching religious TV because I would just get very angry. But this program, it was my wife who got very angry. It was a series of two programs reporting on the new doctrinal commission of the Church of England and the new view of God that they are now considering putting out. And a bishop came on and said, we must see that God needs our help that he is as weak as water. And he used that phrase twice and deliberately, as weak as water. And that the world is in a mess because God needs us to help him out. He portrayed a God to be pitied rather than worshipped. Not a God who was in charge, not the king of the universe. And so the interviewer, who was not a Christian, said, but aren't we to think of God as Father? And the dear bishop said, well, you see, I, I like to think of a large family held together by a grandmother in the family whose affection for everybody holds the thing together. Is God a grandmother? That is near blasphemy. Listen, when I read the Bible, I do not find a God who created all this and left it to run itself. The Bible is theist from cover to cover. It talks of a God who is king and who still reigns. And I, I want to start here this morning because if we don't get the clear faith in our hearts that God is in total control of the situation, that whatever we do, we can't stop God's kingdom coming, that this world has not got out of hand, that he still reigns. Little girl went home from Sunday school singing a chorus she'd learned. God is still on the phone. God is still on the phone. That's about where many people's faith is. He's just someone to talk to you when, when you're in trouble. But listen, God is still on the throne. Have you ever realized that through the Bible, God is presented as in control of every level of creation? He's in control of the wind of the snow, of the waves of the sea, of the frost, of the rain. When was it we had that dreadful winter of snow and ice? Um, two winters ago, three years ago. This was a word that I was reading and preaching from at the time. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. He says to the snow, fall on the earth, and to the rain shower be a mighty downpour, so that all men he has made may know his work. He stops every man from his labor. Now what a sentence. And I found it a great joy to preach that during that snow and ice. Can you not hear God speaking to you? England was paralyzed for days. Nobody could go to work. For days, industry seemed to come to a halt through little bits of cotton wool stuff called snow. And the Bible says that's God's saying, so that you can remember my work, I'll stop yours with snow. Now that's a vivid concept of God as king, isn't it? Of God in total charge. Which is the biggest miracle in the book of Jonah, the whale or the worm? Have you ever asked yourself that? In the early chapters of Jonah, God sends a whale. In the last chapter, he sends a worm. Which is the bigger miracle? Well, you try training a whale, and you try training a worm. 
God is in total control in the Bible of frogs, of flies, of whales, of worms. Forgive me if this sounds like Sunday school teaching. But you see, every part of creation is under his total control. Whether it's the weather or any creature he's made. When they brought the ark back to Jerusalem, they had hitched it to some oxen that had never had a yoke on them. But they went the right way, by themselves. I think of Jesus riding on an ass that no man had ever sat on. You ever tried doing that? That no man has ever sat on? I used to break in horses on the farm. You try sitting on something that no man has sat on. Everything under perfect control. You find that God is in complete control of history as well as nature in the Bible. And that no matter how pagan or how evil a man may be, God is in total control. That's why I like that story of Nebuchadnezzar. The man who thought he was it is not this great Babylon which I have built as my kingdom for my power and my glory? And God said, you're just an animal. And he finished up like Howard Hughes with great long fingernails and unkempt hair, eating grass like an ox. And then his sanity returned. And Nebuchadnezzar said, God, you're in charge. You're in charge. When the Russians invaded Afghanistan, my first reaction was, God, why did you let that happen? Because nothing happens except by God's permission. He's on the throne. And I thought, why did you let the Russians into Afghanistan? And I didn't understand it for at least 15 months. And then I heard this. You probably know that Afghanistan has been closed to the gospel of Jesus for centuries. The most that missionaries could get in was at the border. You may have heard of the Afghan border crusade. Do you know what has happened now? Thousands of Afghan uh, refugees have come out of that country into camps around that country. And the gospel of Jesus is spreading through those camps like a fire. There'll be hundreds of them ready to go back in who know who is king now. I, I could bring so many illustrations to you. I just want you to get a sense that God is in charge. He's in complete control. He is king of the universe. No matter what he's made, he never left it to run on its own. He is still in charge. Therefore, the God of the Bible is still the God who is. And he is a theistic God not a deistic. Do you understand those terms now? Any miracle you read in the Bible, he could do today, or he's not God. People say, but what about the laws of nature? I'll tell you what I think of the laws of nature. I think they are the headmaster's timetable, which he can alter any time he likes. What we call the laws of nature are God's habits God can change them at his pleasure. I've just been in Australia and I worked there with a man whose faith I envied. It was so naive. Do you know what I mean by that? Our faith in Western civilization is so sophisticated that we can't cope with miracles. But this man, his name was Benson Idahosa. He's a Nigerian. And he arrived in Australia with flowing archbishop's robes and a mighty cross around his neck. And uh, when he got to the immigration authorities in Sydney, they said, where's your visa? You've got to have a visa now to get into Australia. And he said, I haven't time to bother with visas. And they said, well, you can't come in here. And he said, I have as much right to be here as you have. And they said, what right have you to be here? He said, this is my father's country. Let him in. <laughs> and he came in. Now that man, Benson, was led to the Lord by an elderly missionary when he was 23. When he didn't have a pair of shoes, 
He had nothing but a pair of shorts. Those were his worldly possessions. And shortly after he became a Christian and had read his New Testament, he said to this missionary, it says here that Jesus raised the dead. And the missionary said, that's right. And so he said, how many dead have you raised? And the missionary said, well, not many lately. Um, or words to that effect. So Benson said, but you said that Jesus was the same today. Yes. So Benson got on his bicycle on that Sunday morning and went round the city of Benin, knocking at doors, saying, is there anybody dead in here? And he couldn't find anybody. Till half past four that afternoon, he heard weeping and wailing coming from a house. And he went up and knocked at the door and said, somebody died here. And they said, uh, yes, we're just about to have the funeral. He said, no need, no need, it's all right. And he came in, and here was a little girl in her coffin. He said, how long has she been dead? And they said, since nine o'clock this morning, so we've got to get the funeral over soon. They were just about to screw the lid on. But he lifted that little body out of the coffin, cuddled her, and he prayed for her. And she sneezed. And he gave her back to her parents. And he went on like that till he'd raised six. And then reported back to the mission. <laughs> I envy someone with naive faith. Everything about our environment here teaches us to regard God as a constitutional monarch who isn't really in charge. And I'll deal tomorrow morning with the problem, well, when you look at the world as it is, it doesn't look as if he's in control. It looks as if it's out of control. Well, that's a question we can deal with. But I want to get firmly in your minds this morning. God is not as weak as water. God is not a helpless, disappointed person in heaven who says, I wanted to do them good, but I couldn't. God is not dependent on us. We are dependent on him. His sovereignty, why he could blot this whole world out tomorrow. And as Martin Luther said, if I'd been God, I'd have kicked the world to pieces long ago. We must never think that the patience of God is his weakness. Or the fact that he allows incredible freedom to blind us to the fact that he has set limits. Those who believe that he is king, that his dominion is an everlasting dominion, that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, that he's on the throne, are those who believe in miracles. They're those who believe in the living God. They're those who believe that God is talking and acting today. And I finish where I began. God is looking for subjects. There's nothing wrong with his sovereignty. His arm is not shortened. He's looking for subjects who will be his kingdom on earth. He's chosen a different way to reestablish paradise to the one we'd have chosen.